invite our compatriots in Mexico to come to the U.S. and do that work for us. So they instituted what's called the Bracero program in the 40s, the 50s, and 60s. And people literally went down to Mexico to recruit and bring folks up here to do this uh, backbreaking work. This, by the way, is how we receive them. Uh, I don't know if you can see because the lighting is less than ideal and it's a very old uh, picture. But we're literally fumigating folks with a chemical that we now know is very, very toxic. And so this is how, how we receive the folks who saved our crops uh, and our farms back then. The states with the highest uh, farm worker concentrations, you're, no surprise to you, are California, Texas, Washington, Florida, followed by Oregon, and then North Carolina. Um, what does the population look like? Most are male, 80% in fact, and it's a fairly young population, around 31 years of age is, is uh, the mean age. And uh, the other fact, of course, is that six out of 10 farm workers live away or apart from their families, uh, which is consistent with uh, folks who migrate. We often end up leaving our families behind while we go out and uh, do really difficult work uh, in the US or other countries now, including Canada. Canada has had, for example, such a large growth of um, Latino community, there's now, in Mexican specifically, there's now a Mexican consulate in Canada, if you can believe that. Uh, where were they born? 75% were born in Mexico. Um, according to a 2005 survey, 53% of farm workers are undocumented, so about half. 25% uh, are United States citizens, and 21% are legal permanent residents. So just to be clear, they're not all undocumented, they're not all quote-unquote illegal. Um, and this is why we come here, because we, we want the same thing everyone else wants. We want a better life for our families and for our children. So here's a question for you. When did immigration to the U.S. increase notably? Since what event? You guys, yeah. Uh, that's a good guess, but no. Any other ideas? Yes? Uh, Max Trade. Excuse me. <laughs> good job. Give him an A. <laughs> he already had it. Oh, he already had it. All right. Yes. So, immigration to the U.S. increased dramatically. Well, sorry, was I not supposed to approach that perimeter? No. <laughs> Uh, immigration to the U.S. has increased since NAFTA was signed in 1994. This is significant. Because the policies of NAFTA were so favorable to the U.S. in comparison to the policies that were given to Mexico, over two million Mexican farmers were driven out of business. So when you start to th ask the question of why do those people keep coming here, I want you to begin to understand that in many instances it is the policy that we have here in the U.S. or that we force upon other nations that drives the very migration that we see here. We need to begin to ask the questions about what are the root causes of the migration to the U.S. and what is our footprint on that policy? What is our footprint on the drivers of those rules and regulations that drive over two million Mexican farm workers out of business? What does this mean practically? I want to give you an example. It literally means that the policies within NAFTA are so favorable to the U.S. that it is literally cheaper for you living in the U.S to buy Mexican corn grown in Mexico than it is for Mexicans to buy corn grown in Mexico. I want you to begin to think about that, to begin to think about the cumulative effect of those kinds of financial and trade policies on our communities. Where are we coming from? These are 
what are referred to as migrant streams. I think I saw some discussion of migrant streams, just the Western migrant stream in the book that you're studying. But these are some of the major migrant streams. Uh, there are about five major ones uh, across the U.S. and then uh, regions from Mexico where are, that are sending states, if you will. So fairly obvious. Uh, farm workers do cross some of these migrant streams, but they're fairly well established and they are now historical migrant streams. So what, what are the demographics for farm workers in the U.S.? 61% uh, had incomes below the poverty uh, level. The median income of individual farm workers is less than $10,500 per year. Let's talk about that. Whose family here rents an apartment? Thank you. Do you know more or less how much your parents pay? Um, I remember we you pay about $15,000? Maybe $1,500 a month? About 15, yeah, it's about, about $1,500 a month. About $1,500 a month? Yeah. Anybody else pay a cheaper rent? Yes? $1,900. $1,900. Okay. Uh, anybody pay 900 My dad has his own apartment. How much he pays? He pays about 900 because it's just him, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this example. That's a really good example. So your dad pays 900 for a one-bedroom? Okay. You guys are probably really much better at math than I am. Multiply 900 a month times 12. What does that get you? I'm assuming you're better at math than I am. <laughs> What's that? Or, uh, no. 100 and... Yeah, it's 100. Wait, you're multiplying... It's 10,800. 10,800, thank you so much. I'm going to assume that that's fairly accurate unless... Uh, <laughs> unless you tell me differently than a math class. <laughs> This is not a math what's, class. What's 9 times 2? 18. 18. What's 9 times 10? 9. Okay, add those two numbers together. I'm the anthropology teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be teaching you math. Come on. Yeah, but I mean, you hated math. Huh? But you hated math. Right? Yeah, but I can do, that's my point, is that I can do basic <laughs> math here. <laughs> All right, so we're, don't anybody else take out their phone. I know that it's not sitting on your lap. Anywhere. 900, just to be sure, times 12 equals, good job, 10,800. It was a team effort, I think. $10,800. That's how much it costs you to rent a one bedroom, right? So subtract 10,800 from 10,500. Do you have any money left over for the year? For groceries? For clothing? For health insurance? How about for buying your children clothing for school? How about for paying for special events for clothing and sports? Uh, how about a paying memberships to a gym, uh, dance class? Okay. So I want you to begin to think about what this looks like on the ground. Why? Mm, have you heard a, a generalized comment folks make about, why do those people always bunch up like that? Why do you always have 20 Mexicans living in a one bedroom apartment? Has anybody heard comments similar to that or like that? That, this by the way, is the answer to why. It is called the creative reallocation of resources. It's not, it's not our first preference. It's not what we choose to do. It's based on systemic forces where someone has decided that we only deserve to get paid $10,000 a year for our back-breaking labor. Does this mean that sometimes folks have to work two jobs? So for those teachers in the room, and I think it's just one, when you don't see our parents showing up to PTA meetings, when they seem unengaged from their students' 
uh, academic success. It's likely because by the time that you're starting your PTA meeting, they're starting their second or third job for the day. Not to mention that we don't feel safe in these spaces because we generally associate them with government. But that's a different discussion. I just want you to begin to think about that. And to begin to ask the question, why haven't I thought about this before? What questions are informed by my privilege? What questions do I not ask because of my privilege? Uh, farm workers uh, suffer from the highest rate of toxic chemical injuries, skin disorders of any workers in the country, as well as significant eye injuries. Um, children and farm workers have higher rates of pesticide exposure, malnutrition, dental disease, and the general population, by the way, uh, child farm worker is the only, it's the only place that children are not, don't have workplace protections. It's the only industry where children are not protected. You, if you're 14, can't go work at McDonald's or uh, at the Safeway, but if you're a farm worker child, if you're the child of a farm worker, there are no legal protections for you. Uh, our migrant children are less likely to be immunized than other children. Why? Any guesses as to why that is? They wouldn't have a lot of actual immunized. Uh, money's one thing. Who else spoke? They have to go to a doctor's office and they have to take one. All of that's also true. We also move around a lot. Right? Um, so this is no surprise to you. Poor migrant housing conditions. Uh, increase uh, the prevalence of lead poisoning, respiratory illness, ear infections, and diarrhea. Why is that? I don't know if you've seen what 